Riverdale save their ball bands, but then just leaves them disorganized. Hi, my name is Kirsten. This is the Paper Knits podcast. This is episode one. This has been on my mind for too long. And you know what? It's just, it was time. I'm a stay-at-home mom. I have three kids, uh, two boys and a girl. Um, but my daughter passed away uh, at one week old in December this past year, um, like four months ago. Um, and yeah, very much um, in the thick of figuring out grief and knitting has been an important thing for me in that and uh which like feels kind of hard to explain to people who like aren't obsessively into knitting um i think that people who also find a great deal of value in in their knitting can relate to that about it being um a bit of a saving grace for me during like a super horrible time um but that's also part of why I um, wanted to start podcasting. I want to be able to talk about this craft that I love so much and that has been such a helpful thing in my life for so long and has, I'm like, I'm so thankful that I've had knitting um, in these past four months dealing with um, like such a tragedy, losing my baby. And um, yeah, it like feels maybe kind of uh, frivolous, I think. to I imagine somebody might think it's frivolous, I guess. It's like, oh, a cute little craft that you do sometimes, right? And it actually being something that's like very therapeutic for me. And I'm trying to own that, you know, like, it's okay that it's therapeutic for me and it's okay that other people don't understand. I'm hoping that um, by like putting myself on the internet, um, there will be some other people out there who, who do understand that and uh, yeah, would have a, a similar appreciation for um, something like knitting. So I'm always interested to know like how people started knitting and what it is that they like about it. And so I wanted to share a little bit about that too for myself and um, I had learned to crochet um, like as a teenager I think my mom taught me and like had a very like you know wonky ugly yellow scarf and that was kind of that and then in university um, my my friend and I started learning some more and so I crocheted a blanket that year watching Gilmore Girls with her when we should have been not watching Gilmore Girls we should have probably been studying um, but that, like, I use that blanket every day, so that, I guess that was good. Um, I don't use my degree, um, so I guess I use my blanket. Um, and uh, anyways, a couple years after that, then I, I decided I wanted to learn how to knit. And I think I like got a book out of the library, uh, found some things on YouTube, and very quickly uh, was like, what's Gage? Why can't I make a hat? My needles don't go around in a circle. There was a lot. There was a lot of ups and downs there. And uh, I don't know why I stuck with it because it like was super frustrating. And I figured out really quickly that I was knitting. I think I had started to try and learn like English style throwing, whatever. Um, but because I had crocheted before and I was holding the yarn in my left hand with crochet. So then I discovered, oh, you can do that with knitting too. Um... But then for a while, I just was like twisting all of my stitches and like couldn't figure that out. It's so tight. And I, as soon as I dropped a stitch, it was just like game over. I had to start again. That was frustrating. But for whatever reason, I, I stuck it out. I didn't really like become, so that was probably like 15 years ago. I didn't like really become um, super invested into it until uh, I think I was, I would have been pregnant with my first. And so that was like eight years ago and um, made him a couple little sweaters and um, a little hat 
which all three of my babies have worn now and so that feels very special and did a little bit more knitting than throughout that year um had another baby you know two years later did a little bit of knitting for him like made a actually i started making this um, blanket that's on the couch behind me it's the um, mosaic blanket by pearl soho and uh, i started making that as a as a baby blanket for my second and then finished it like he, when he was like a year old um and actually i have another uh a blank, another baby blanket that never really got finished for him either. Turns out it was hard to knit when you were like pregnant and couldn't move and had a two-year-old. Um, that was that was tricky. So um, probably when my second was like a year old, I started like being a knitter, you know. So um, four years ago, and ever since then, I would say that it's like I I've knit more days than not, and haha, <laughs> I'm sorry, I've knit more days than not, and that it's become like an integral part of my life um, since then. And at some point I would really like to share all the things that I knit for my daughter uh, when I was pregnant with her. That's another thing that I wanted. I don't know, how, they feel really important to me and I don't know how to share them with the world. And not that I, I, not that I need to share them with the world, but I want to, you know? And one day I'll, I'll share that but that was something that was really important to me throughout my pregnancy with her was um, knitting for her and um, being able to create in that way and then knitting next to her NICU bed and knitting in the aftermath I'm so grateful that it was something that remained um, helpful for me and I'll talk more about that another day. One of the funny things about, um, you know, me wanting to start doing this two years ago, um, was I was feeling at the time, like there's a million knitting podcasters. Like why would there need to be another one? And then now two years have gone by and then there's like, there's so many more. Um, but also there's a lot of people in the world and different people vibe with different things and um, there's always more knitting patterns to show off and always more beautiful yarn to see and I think that the people who like to watch knitting podcasts like seeing all of those things and I feel um, you know it's just it's interesting it, it's kind of there's like instant imposter syndrome right what do I have to say that has not already been said um, what do I have to offer? And yeah, I'm trying to get, get past that, I guess. Um, it seems like I'm not, I've not been big into cliches about, uh, like things do not happen for a reason my baby did not die for some grander purpose for me to be able to embrace life more fully or be able to transform this into something positive or good or that she died so that I may blah 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 um thankfully we haven't gotten a lot of that um like rhetoric back from people um but it also feels just like part of our culture and like how they how we talk about grief and yeah so don't like don't like the cliches and I feel like one of the cliches that I'm not as like uncomfortable with I guess is like life is short like you need to live life to the fullest and like ah that hasn't like exactly been my um my stance I have struggled with depression and anxiety for a long time actually yeah, there's this <laughs> there's this joke this meme it's like I don't struggle with anxiety I am really good at it um that's kind of been where what it's been at um I don't have like some new lease on life where I'm like you know see the glass half full and like rosy whatever it has made me feel like you know what 
I should just do whatever the F I want because life is unpredictable and sometimes it really sucks. And if I am going to stop myself from doing um, something that I want to do because I'm worried about other people, like, oh, I shouldn't do that. One of my grief books talks about, um, you know, that this is not a lesson that you would ever choose to have learned. But if you're being forced to learn it, then um, then then it's okay to learn something from it. I would never have chosen to learn anything through the experience of losing my baby. That should never happen. Babies are not supposed to die. If something that my daughter can teach me is to be more myself and do something that's scary, <laughs> then I thank her for coming alongside me as I figure those things out. <sighs> okay, well, I wanna talk about what I'm wearing it just feels a little bit on the nose, you know, I'm going to do the podcaster thing now. That's okay. Being self-aware about it. I don't need to be self-conscious about it. This is the Ember Sweater uh, by Yuko Shimizu. And I've been like obsessed with this sweater since I saw Selena's version from Dink Fiber slash um, Woolen Pine. It's one half of Woolen Pine. She knit a version of it um, back like in 2019 when it was released. And I just like, I've been returning to it. I just like, I was just obsessed with her colors. It was so interesting to me. And I don't, like, I feel more confident now, but like at the time, like not feel confident about choosing colors. And um, yeah, she she talked a bit about the sweater. I think she did in like one of her Patreon videos, maybe. Anyways, I was like, I was obsessed with it. And I've had it saved for a long time, bought the pattern quite a while ago and actually bought the yarn quite a while ago. I bought the yarn last summer and I like hunted for what, like the exact yarn that I wanted. I wanted, I just wanted Selena's sweater. So she knit it with um, Olan and I can't remember and another yarn and uh, her green was Olan. It was called Middle of Nowhere and I like scoured the internet looking for it last summer. And I think I ended up ordering it from someplace in the States. It's like expensive yarn to begin with. And then I had to order it from the States. And so it was even more expensive. And I, I bought all of it was from Olan. So the green and then a pink Love Vigilantes and Hot Dame. Um, this is all that I have left of the purple. Ooh, it's getting it close. Um, this, I have tons of this left. Um, anyways, and then this green. It's called Middle of Nowhere. And uh, just like how it played with like the greens from the Middle of Nowhere. And there was a little bit of like the deep purple and a little bit of pink. And just like how it all played together. It just look, it looked, Selena's looked so good. But of course, she bought that yarn in 2019. I like bought some random skeins last summer. And when it showed up, I was like, ooh, okay, not quite what I was envisioning. Um, it was definitely, Selena would say, scummy, scummy green. Um, but like a little bit more than I was looking for. And very, very, very dated. And so I swatched with the light pink. And it was not... It was not pretty is what it was. This is my swatch. This is the, um, the green on the bottom is just the middle of nowhere color. And then up here I had started like testing for the color work and there's just, there's no, there was no contrast between it. Hmm. You know what? Can't remember. Made this last summer. I, this just looked like the pink and the purple contrasted not with the green in there too. Anyways, I wasn't happy with it. I didn't like it. That's not what I wanted. It went quickly into timeout and 
here I had, I think I had three skeins of this, um, the green color. I didn't like it. I didn't want to, I didn't know what to do with it. It just like sat in a pile. I knew that I didn't want to knit with that. I knew that I had to buy more, like three more skeins then of a different yarn. And yeah, I just, I stalled out. So I think I went searching in November at a local fiber festival. And so there's one, there's a company here in Edmonton called Numana Yarns and they have a bazillion colors and has a very nice website where you can like sort by color and like look through all the things. They have lots of different bases. Um, the other line was just singles. Yeah, just singles. And so like that's, I wanted to match that. They had that option. Okay, great. So like I, I made all, I made a list of like, okay, these are the greens I want to look at. And then when I went to the festival, then they had their whole big booth and I like looked at all the different ones, like found exactly. And, um, they're like, you look like you're on a mission. <laughs> it's like, I really was. And so I found these two skeins that were that, that's what I was looking for. The colorway is called Patina. I'm not sure if they still make it because she said that it was like a no dye left behind. And those were her only two skeins. And so I like quickly like crunched the numbers. It's like I would have bought three, um, but she only had two, but like, that's the color I wanted. I had brought along the like pink and purple to like compare. And anyways, it it turned out, I think it's, it's what I wanted. If I, if there had been little bits of like purple and pink in it, then probably that would have been my like one step even better, but I'm happy with how that turned out. I actually, if I could go back in time, I would pink a different, pick a different light pink color. It's like, it's much more like peachy than what I wanted, but it's fine. And uh, I didn't have much green left. I like, even bit, I guess. I actually ended up um, having to rip out some of my sleeve, and so I had some extra stuff. I uh, I bought a knitting knotty. <laughs> I, I guess one of my half crafts is also I try and spin, and for some reason I just had it in my head like, no, I can't put a skein of yarn onto my Swift. I need a knitting knotty to like, you know. Um, anyways, I was trying to unravel the like. You can kind of see the forbidden noodles of yarn, you know, when you pull something out. Um, anyways, I do have a little bit of green left. I might lengthen it a little bit. It's definitely cropped, which it was meant to be even way more cropped than I think I actually knit it to. I like lengthened it. I like added, I like made my own, I made a new like color work section to add in. Um, the pattern is very interesting. It's very unique. And it's meant to be like very oversized, a lot of positive ease. It's really interesting with like, you know, you split, um, you split for sleeves and like immediately decrease on the arms and the body, I think for sure on the arms. And then, and then you increase again and then you decrease again. And so it makes these like big, really like voluminous sleeves and the body was similar. I think it like, it was really a, like a lot of positive ease around like right before the split, which of course though is like. I don't know how many stitches it was. It was so many stitches and it's three colors at a time that you're like tying. Oh, it was so much knitting. And, uh, I ended up like, <clears throat> I ended up like reworking the whole pattern pretty well. Um, because I'm not cool enough to wear it how it was like intended. And I didn't want really like a really deep yoke, uh, with a kind of like, you know, deep armholes and kind of, you know, this. Um, so I like fudged that a little bit and I could not wrap my head around like how much ease there was. Um, I still don't, I still don't understand the proportions of the sweater. And like, if there was an inch or two less length than what I added and it still feels a little bit short for me, but I just like haven't quite figured out how to style it yet. I like wearing it with my only pair of high waisted jeans they're like, I want a dark wash jean to go with it. I don't have that right now. Whatever. We just, we make do. So anyways, um, I love the, um, how the color work kind of plays on the, the cuff and on the hem, the like green against the purple. I just like a lot so much. Um, realizing that I haven't actually blocked this yet. So I, sh I should block it and see if it grows a little bit in length. Um, I did 
I did some surgery on it. Um, the sleeves have a lot of positive ease and I think I knit for like a few inches before I started decreasing and they were they were they were too long and they were very voluminous and so I ended up picking up ripping back and then like graft it back together again on both sides and I'm like I'm so happy I did that because it's like it still has quite a bit of ease but because they were too long as well it was like bunching it so I had to do some surgery and glad that I did it's yeah more it's definitely more um wearable now for me so anyways that's my ember sweater I'm really happy with it it's been a long time coming um and it's like I don't wear color really this is like it's not like it's that out there it's not neons it's been a bit of a stretch for me that's okay okay um what I'm working on right now I have a couple projects that I want to I have like a deadline in mind about when I wanted to finish them um and I think I'll I think I'll I'll make it yeah so one of them is the stone crop cardigan by Andrew Mowry um I <laughs> okay so one of the things that happened after my daughter died was I bought a whole bunch of yarn impulse buy um there was a lot of boxing day sales you know um yeah a lot of yarn, a lot of yarn. I so one of those purchases was two skeins of um, spin cycle dyed in the wool that I bought from the knitting loft and uh, this is the color this is the pink um, it's the color wallflower and I have had this sweater in my mind for a while um, and then had actually bought different spin cycle and a different like uh, main color it was gray and like you know I didn't like they didn't vibe well and so when I saw this um, wallflower color and then I had this blue is Briggs and Little sport that I had bought ages ago because I was going to make um, I was gonna make the Darren cardigan by Jacqueline Sis Sislak and had bought this um, yarn for that purpose Very quickly changed plans. I think my, you can't see that, the dark navy blue swatch back there. That's like the biggest swatch I've ever knit in my life. I didn't like what it was gonna end up being, I think in the form of that cardigan. But I decided, oh, the blue with the pink and the purple, I really loved. So um, for some reason I purchased the pullover pattern instead of the cardigan pattern and like refused to spend seven more dollars to just buy the cardigan pattern and so I've kind of been fudging this a little bit um my gauge was a little bit off I also crunched some numbers on here a lot of a lot of the projects were mentioning that the neckline was quite wide and I didn't want that and so I used some numbers from the strange brew pattern from tin can knits and um decided to do I don't yeah Maybe this is what the does in the cardigan pattern. I don't know because I didn't buy it. Um, but I did a provisional cast on for the neckline and then um, can try it on and see if it's like, if it's, you know, how wide it is and then kind of adjust from there when I do the neckband. Um, and I was kind of in between sizes and I just like had this very particular image in my mind about what I wanted to, to look like. And so I did a little bit of, like I did quite a bit of math actually for this. Um, I have steaked before. I'm not a confident steaker, but whatever, as my own steak column. Um, I can't remember actually if the, if the cardigan pattern itself is steaked or if it's just knit flat. Um, the color work is simple. Um, I, I skipped the baubles. Um, I just finished a sweater that had a ton of baubles didn't want to do that so I just made a different texture I like the the pearl texture and stuff with it but 
anyway, so this is where I'm at. I've got um, a sleeve done. I'm starting on the other sleeve. Um, I've kind of been picking through the spin cycle to to try and match it up a little bit, not too much. Um, I really like this pink and purple section here more so than like say this like more pink pink section here. Um, so I wish I would add a little bit more of the purple in that sleeve, but whatever, it's fine. So I need to finish the sleeve. I need to figure out what order I'm supposed to do things in that next if I do the neck band and then the button band. I need to figure out what I want to do for the button band. I noticed, noticed too in a lot of the um, projects on Ravelry that it looked like the button band was kind of like didn't look that sturdy and so it was like kind of pulling at all of the buttons. It's like I don't, I don't need to add any more like extra pulling you know. Um, so I gotta figure that out but anyways it's coming along it's like an interesting mix with like the Briggs and Little is like quite quite rustic right it's like it's not a cozy soft yarn it does bloom and like soften quite a lot with blocking which is really nice um anyways I think it's working I think it's working well so yeah that's where I'm at with that I also just am seeing oh here this is just like the rest of my kind of messy ball but um, you can kind of see, I love, I love these caked up. You can just like see the gradient so nicely. And so there's some more purple coming. I might, might get that out. Um, I just have this book in my, in my bag and now I have to talk about it. Um, Patty Lyons knitting bag of tricks. I've done a couple of, uh, um, like during like height of COVID Vogue knitting was doing like online they call them conferences I don't know anyways I laid like a whole bunch of them um during COVID and did a couple with Patty Lyons she's like she's intense man um and like totally called me out about like I'm a very loose knitter like she she knows why anyways I bought this book um she's like if you want to know about how to do something like troubleshoot or um like, oh, why am I having this problem? Like, Patty probably has the answer for you. Um, and so it's like, oh, I don't need to buy a book. Like, it's, I should just, like, she has tons of videos on YouTube. She has lots of resources out there. Um, but this book has been really good so far. And the, her, she has this, like, wonderful hack for knitting a swatch in the round. I prefer knitting in the round. I hate swatching in the round. It's so tedious. This, all of this, I can't stand it. And I never want to cut them because I'm very precious about like using up all of my yarn. And so if you cut, if you cut it, it's just, you can't do anything with it ever again. And I'm not cutting, I just, I'm not cutting through a spin cycle, a, a spin cycle swatch, you know? And I'm not, Patty still would just like, she would still, have things to say about my swatches because I knit small swatches um but that too it's like I'm not using up half a skein I don't know how much it would actually take half a skein of skin spin cycle to knit my swatch and then cut it like there's no there's no way so anyway she has this great hack for knitting a color work swatch knitting a, a, a swatch ugh, knitting a swatch in the round that you don't end up with all of the things across the back and so I'm not going to tell you how to do it because you should literally go buy the book because it's worth it. Um, just for like this hack. I was trying to look and see if she had it on her YouTube channel, but I couldn't, I didn't look that closely. I should look again. Anyways, it's just, it's so much better and so much less fussy with like doing color work in the round. Um, it's the best. She had some like really good tips about, um, you know, you're like, Oh, you like knit a garter edge on your swatch that it doesn't curl. And she's like, don't do that. Garter has a different gauge than stockinette. And so it's going to distort your swatch. And so especially if you're just knitting a tiny swatch, um, like it's not a good idea. So anyways, um, highly recommend. So still crop sweater. I guess I'm, I, I'm, you know, Andrew Mary's doing like a knit along thing right now, the March to May. I just realized 
I don't know if it goes when it technically ends. Does it end at the start of May or does it end at the end of May? The start of May is quickly approaching. Um, I just was thinking like, hmm, by the time I post this video, it might already be May. Anyways, I have this vision of a pink collar, sleeveless, like button front dress. And I'll see if I can find a picture in it of my mind. But that's what I envision wearing this with. So it's like has the little collar sticking out and has this like cropped cute cardigan over top with the pink and the blue. That's what I'm picturing. Um, in theory, I'm going to sew this dress. And actually I have fabric that I bought years ago. And I need to pull it out again and see if I have enough to make that. It's actually this fabric that I then cut into to make this project big. So it's like linen, it's I think, is it real linen? I'm not sure, it's linen-like. Um, so yeah, I made this project big um, a couple years ago. It's super handy, I really like it. Um, it's a pattern by Indigo Bird Designs on Etsy. Um, yeah, it's really good. It's got my pins on it, which make me happy. Um, it's got lots of like, pockets inside pocket here um you can either make it with like like tote handles or like just these kind of little ones it's not like it's not secure um it's probably could add a snap or something to it but anyways i've made a couple and i really like them um so this is my other project um the birds of a feather uh also by andrew mowry this one was to use i had these i had two skeins of Farmer's Daughter Fibers Oding. So it's their Surrey, Surrey Alpaca and Silk Base in the color Highwayman, which I got from somebody local who was like de-sashing. I had this like, like from really nice, really like high-end yarn for sale. So I like could not buy it. Um, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with it. I was like, no, I'll make a ranunculus. Like that's what you do when you have two random skeins of thin yarn, right? Um, but I, yes, just, just wasn't sure. The idea of like a Surrey alpaca, like teacher seems like strange to me. Um, and I wanted to use stash. And so the other skein that's in here is a yarn from the Yak Yarnery. Um, and let's see. Okay. Found it. It is the Yak Yarnery Yakety Yak Sock. It's 70% superwash merino, 20% yak, 10% nylon. Um, so she's a yarn dyer. She owns a yarn store in Rocky Mountain House here in Alberta. Um, I bought a couple of random skeins a couple years ago. Um, knit a ranunculus with 1.1 of the skeins and uh, wanted to use up some stash. So anyways, that's what this is. I wanted to use the Farmer's Daughter, because I'm going to Farmer's Daughter Retreat this summer, which I'm so excited about in Montana. And I wanted to have something that was like with their yarn while I was there. So probably a like Surrey Alpaca and Yak shawl in Montana in June isn't um, like super needed, but whatever, that's fine. Um, so it's coming along. I um, have, it's been on hold. <laughs> Aaron was stuck on my boob pin. It's been on hold because the plan is, is that I'm unraveling my ranunculus um, to reclaim the yarn. I never wear it. It's too short. Um, it's too thin. So I was like, where's something underneath of it? But then you can like see it underneath of the lace part at the top. And it's just, it's not my, it's not my vibe. I enjoyed knitting it. It was super fast. I like didn't swatch just like, Let's figure this out as we go. 
Um, and I probably will make another one, but this one is not it. So I need to unravel it. I need to probably block out or steam the yarn and then I can finish this. Um, so I haven't worked on it now in a couple weeks. I need to circle back to that and figure out where I'm at. Um, I'm going to have leftover of the Odang, um, but I guess I'll find something else to do with that. So, okay. I have a few other whips. I will maybe talk about them another day. Probably I should give a disclaimer about talking about grief and infant death. Um, maybe it seems kind of weird in a knitting podcast to talk about those things, but it is obviously very present in my life right now. Also feel just like self-aware about like it's been four months. It's very raw and also there's not like some way to like, oh, I have now healed and I've wrapped this up, this thing up into a little tiny package with a bow on it and like put it on the shelf and now everything's better. Like that's not, oh, that's not how it works. It's never going to be okay that my baby died. And yeah, I guess right now that grief is interwoven into every aspect of my life, including my knitting. Um, huh, another thing I should mention when I first was like, nothing matters. I should just do whatever I want. What I wanted to do and what I am still going to do is start a blog. I have written a handful of like blog posts um, that will probably one day see the light of day. I'm having some technical difficulties trying to get the freaking blog set up. Um, but writing about my grief has been very helpful for me and writing about how that has intersected with my knitting has been helpful for me. And it's like pretty niche. Um, and you know, I also feel just kind of aware about um, I don't know if somebody would be like, you're mining your baby's death for content. Um, I guess I can only know for myself that that's not what I'm doing. Like, and if you feel that way, then like, you don't have to watch. You don't have to read what I write. It's, that's cool. Um, I think it's important to talk about my grief. And it's something that's very present for me all the time. Um, so I can't not talk about it, I guess. Like I could, but like that would feel very like separate from myself. Um, so yeah, I guess if you're like, that's weird that she's talking about this on a knitting podcast, then that's cool. You don't have to consume my content. Um, if you're like, hey, that hits really close to home for me. I don't want to hear her talk about that. Like, totally fair. Totally get it. 100% get it. Um, it's just, it's what my life is right now. And um, I, it's important for me to be able to talk about it. I'm at paper.knits on Instagram. I'm, this is Paper Knits on Ravelry. Um, I love finding new knitters to follow on Instagram and um, I have been trying to keep up with the um, the forums for the Andrew Mowry knit along but like man there's a lot of posts in there I hadn't looked at it in a while there was like 2,500 2,500 unread posts in the sweater one the shawl one is much more chill um, but I haven't looked at it now in ages um, got got overwhelming um, which that's fine um, so yeah, come come find me on Instagram though. That's probably where I, that that's where to find me. Um, that's where I'm most mostly at. And um, thanks for watching.